Living a well-balanced lifestyle goes beyond ensuring your finances are in order. Welcome to Keeping the Well in Wealthy with Barbara Archer from Hightower. Barbara speaks with wellness industry leaders and related professionals to share more than financial planning advice. She addresses your questions about living a healthy lifestyle at any age. Learn how to gracefully maneuver life's challenges with support and resources to guide you along the way. Barbara and the team at Hightower help you make a plan, make an investment, and make a difference in your own wealth and well-being, and in your families, and within your community. Thank you for listening to Keeping the Well in Wealthy with Barbara Archer, sponsored by Hightower. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Keeping the Well in Wealthy with your host, Barbara Archer from Hightower. Barbara, it's so good to be back with you. How are you? I am terrific, Eric, and good to be back with you today. Yeah, so I mean, are you having a pleasant day, I hope? Oh, absolutely. It's been wonderful. How about you? Oh, it's been awesome. We have some great weather, so I'm happy. Nice. Sunshine and, does it. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a, some, Sometimes that's a little lacking. It feels good to get that vitamin D. So you have a guest today. So this is going to kind of round out our day today. You've got a guest that you brought on the show. What are you guys talking about? Well, Eric, I'm going to talk about breaking money silence. So I have a question mm. for you. But, well, first of all, I just read a startling statistic. This is so surprising to me. And that is almost half of Americans would rather discuss death, religion, or politics than finances. So does that sound like some interesting cocktail party conversation? Yeah, that's that's actually really surprising to me. I mean, who <laughs> wants to talk about politics before money? <laughs> I mean, I was just so surprised. Yeah. So today, we want to continue a conversation on wellness and well-being and how money plays a part in how it impacts our psyche and our health. Mm. So Eric, are you comfortable with money conversations with your family and with your friends? Yes, absolutely. I've actually spoken about this before with several people. Like my parents didn't talk to us about money at all. Right. It was almost a taboo subject. And I remember as I was growing up and as I got older, I was like, I'm never going to do that with my kids. I want to be very transparent. I'm not saying that I spoke to them about money in a good way. <laughs> Maybe I, <laughs> I want to make sure the messages were good to them, but we just didn't talk about it at all as a kid. So I don't know what your experience yeah. was like. Well, but... mine was... I asked my mother once why we never talked about money. And she said, well, when you don't have any, there's nothing to talk about. So mine was go. easy. Yeah. <laughs> so it was real yeah. simple. Let me introduce our guest, Kathleen Burns Kingsbury, a wealth psychology expert and coach who will start us on the path to more productive financial dialogues. So Kathleen is founder of KBK Wealth Connection and host of the Breaking Money Silence podcast is an internationally published author, Breaking Money Silence, How to Shatter Money Taboos, Talk More Openly About Finances and Live a Richer Life, which is Kathleen's fifth book. And she's an expert on financial psychology, where Kathleen has appeared on television and written for consumer and trade publications. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Money Magazine, Forums, and CNBC, to name a few. And Kathleen has taught the psychology of financial planning in the CFP program. For those of you that don't know CFP, it's Certified Financial Planning Program, and currently teaches in the Business and Management School at Champlain College. Kathleen is a keynote speaker, consultant, and coach on the topic of women and wealth and couples and money. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you, Barbara. It's so nice to be here, and I'm excited to break money silence with you. Well, I'm looking forward to it because this is just so refreshing to have you join us today to actually talk about money and finances. Um, and together, we can continue to break that silence and help some of those feeling stressed about using the M or money word. <laughs> so what drove you to become an expert in financial psychology? It's such a great question, and I'll try to be short with it. Basically, I experienced my own money trauma. My husband and I had put on an addition on our house, and soon thereafter, when the foundation went up, our contractor disappeared. So oh, needless no. to say, this led to many financial conversations, some of them very heated in my marriage. Uh, and at the time, I had been working as a licensed mental health counselor. So of course, I did what any good licensed mental health counselor would do, and I started to look into this thing called money and really explore um, why was I having the reaction I was having and how did I get out of it? Because I just felt so victimized, even though 
I was very financially literate. So it led to this curiosity about how behaviors and feelings and our money personalities kind of come together to influence how we make financial decisions and how we live our lives individually or as a member of a couple. And so that curiosity just built and built and built. And eventually I said, you know what? Now that I'm feeling better, I'm going to help others feel better around money too. Good decision. Thank you for that. I can remember hearing my great aunt say that a lady never discusses money. Mm. Actually, they said sex and money. So I guess their conversations were somewhat boring at times. So today I'd like to address how stifling the money conversation does affect us. And it does impact our health, just as you mentioned, our psyche, how we feel about ourselves, our relationships, so the negative impacts on our well-being. So I'd like to start close to home. What can you tell us how we relate to our own relationships with money? Well, what you talked about, and I think Eric is an exception, is that many of us really grew up in a family or in a society where it was taboo to talk about money. And you just mentioned, okay. Barbara, how it can be even more taboo or more uncomfortable for women to talk about money based on some of the gender stereotypes that are still out there. And so I think what is really important, a first step for anybody who wants to have a better relationship with money and wants to have greater financial well-being is to start to look at what are my automatic thoughts and beliefs about money and wealth and its purpose in the world. And through doing that, you start to realize, wow, you know, it makes sense that I think this way and I behave that way. And then you start to examine, do I still want to behave the way I've been behaving? So in other words, is it serving me today to behave the way I was taught when I was growing up or does it make sense to do something different? So that process of really looking at what's called a money mindset and identifying those thoughts, feelings, and behaviors is a nice way to start to develop a relationship with money. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is imagine going on a date. Imagine going on a first date with a partner, a husband, a spouse, a girlfriend, whatever it might be. And you decide, you know what? We're going to have a relationship and we're never, ever going to talk again. So that's basically what we do with money. <laughs> we get introduced to money. Hey, money, you're going to be a big part of my life. And I'm never, ever going to have really talk to you or have a relationship with you. That's so a very good work, analogy. Yeah. So oh all the work gosh. that I do really um, kind of drills down to almost dating your money or having a conversation with money so you can develop a good relationship with it because you have to have that good relationship with it in order to then talk to other people in your life about it. Wonderful. Well, you had mentioned even with the stress that you felt during your housing debacle, the, that improvement, <laughs> how yes. that had an effect with your spouse. So oh, people huge. that have a significant other or someone else, I mean, it could be with a family member, a friend sharing an apartment, but that relationship between two people and money can be very, very uncomfortable. So how did you address your situation and what good advice could you give us about talking to our significant others about it? Sure. So what was so interesting about what happened when we got ripped off by the contractor, which ended up being a great gift because I'm sitting here talking to you because of my contractor friend, Steve. But what had ended up happening is my husband and I realized uh, that we always got along around money. We always kind of didn't have problems around money as, as a partner or as couples. But when this stress hit our lives, we realized how differently we were raised around money. Mm. I was raised in a home where it was middle America. It was very thrifty. You had a savings and emergency fund, and you always had it fully funded. My husband was in a single family home with the mother just trying to make ends meet. So when uh, we got ripped off and we started to get stressed out about money, we had very different reactions. He kind of went into avoidance mode and I went mm. into hypervigilant mode. And so it wasn't until we found our sense of humor around it that we realized, oh, wait a second, this is an opportunity to talk about money and pull on each other's strengths. And so what ended up happening is I let him have a little bit of control, big me, like letting him. Uh, You're so he, adult. I know I it was it. such an adult decision. <laughs> yes. And I let, and he decided he would show up a little bit more for financial conversations. So the bottom line is 
no matter where your relationship is with money and a partner, I think it's really important to, instead of say, you're doing it wrong, say, hey, wait a second, how do you do this thing called money? How did you grow up around money? And then what are some of the things that maybe you do that I don't know about or I'm not good at? Maybe we can draw upon those and vice versa. So instead of blaming the other person or saying you should do money like me, which I certainly was doing at that time, sure. you turn to your partner and you start to have dialogues about how can together we be a better team and pull on each of our strengths and do this thing called money a little bit better. I think the other advice I would give to anybody out there in a couplehood is just there's going to be bumps in a road. And if you can get through these bumps and learn from these mistakes and grow, then that's what's important. Not that you got ripped off or that you made a money mistake. It's what you learned from it. So to continue to keep that dialogue open. Oh, that's lovely. Well, so in a relationship, Women that I've read on average were about twice as likely to associate cash flow with love and emotion. I've read some of that, and I think you have some other data where men were more, well, twice as likely to see money as a sign of power and freedom. And, and some of that may have changed over the past few years. What can you share with me on that? Well, what's interesting, I mean, that's just an interesting statistic, right? I do sure. think that when you look at the research and when you interview men and women, what you find is that historically, and there can be exceptions to this, but historically, men and women think about it differently. Women tend to think about it in terms of financial freedom, independence, having money to care for the people that they love and the community around them. Men mm -hmm. traditionally tended to look at it wealth as financial return on investment, and how can I have power and status? And then later in life, maybe they start looking at giving to the community and philanthropy, things like that. Uh, I do think that's shifting and changing, Barbara, with the newer generations. I think I there's, agree. yeah, I think there's more of a, you know what, money is important. I really do think we're breaking through the money talk taboo. And I think both men and women are looking at how can we have a healthier relationship with money and how can we learn about money, but not just to make it to make it, but to have experiences and have a rich life. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this next generation and money. Well, I see it where obviously with our team and our younger or next generation clients, they are more balanced than we were at our age at that time. It was work, 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 right? And mm. I think it was more from a, a more from a fear-based situation because of the years that we graduated when there was so much competition for jobs mm -hmm. and there were so many changes going on in our world that we felt we had to put our heads down. And it was also peer pressure, right? We had to mm -hmm. go in early and work late. Part of it was peer pressure, where now they know to live a more balanced life and they put things in perspective. And hopefully they're hearing more from their parents and their families and they're being more aware of the importance of other items besides and relationships besides money. So I think this is the next introduction that we can move into, and that's how you pass down your financial literacy, your wealth to future generations, and how we help them to continue to grow and have that healthy relationship with money. One of the statistics I want to share with you and with the listeners is the idea that this statement, our society would be healthier if we talked more about money. 71% of millennials, now millennials are a little on the old side these days, but <laughs> millennials agree with that statement. So I think there's real progress in people wanting to break money silence, wanting to talk about money. And like you said, I think there's a healthy balance that people are trying to achieve that maybe we didn't have in the 80s and 90s when greed was good, so to speak. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Well, and the other part is when I get questions from younger people about environmental concerns or about human rights or about something that's more responsible investing or what does that company do? What do they, you know, do they give back to the communities, to, to the universe? So it's interesting that they want to dig a little deeper as to the greater good from good investing. Yes. I love that. I think that's really great. And I think both, I don't think it's gender specific. I think it's no, more the it next generation, the culture, and even, you know, I belong to a women's group that does women in investing and we educate ourselves. And part of what we educate ourselves about 
is making sure that we're investing in a way or spending money with businesses that are giving back. So I do think that that's uh, a nice shift from when probably you and I entered this field. So when's the right time to start educating our children on financial literacy? Well, there is a right time and then there's a realistic time. So the, okay. <laughs> the perfect time, according to all the experts, including myself, is as soon as possible. So around okay. age five, young people start to become aware of this thing called money and they develop their thoughts and beliefs and, and money scripts and ideas about money that influence their behaviors up through age 15, 16. So the idea is if you can talk to and teach kids about money at these foundational years, you can set them up for success. Well, let's look at what really happens in our society. Some people do that, but a lot of people don't. So I'm of the belief that it's never too late to talk to your children about money, even if they're adult children. It is um, good to be able to engage in these conversations, especially if you happen to be a family of wealth. By doing it sooner, when you start to get into talking about passing on wealth and what the inheritance is going to look like and training the next gen mm. to be able to receive that wealth, it isn't the first money conversation you've had. There's kind of been this series of money conversations. So instead of like, whoa, we're talking about money, it's, oh, another conversation about money. Um, so the idea is early and often, but anybody out there who says, oof, I blew it, you haven't blown it, you can start today. Oh, wonderful. So it's never too late. Yes. But, you know, it is interesting. We talk about people with great wealth moving money to the next generation, but having that conversation with your children earlier, especially before college, because I didn't have that privilege of having the conversations growing up about money. I can remember going to college and being embarrassed to go to a bank to open my first checking account. It's just not something my you didn't family know how to encouraged do it? me. I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. I knew I needed one, but I didn't have one and no one helped me. And I was fortunate enough that at the bank, someone educated me on how to write a check, right? Yep. So, I mean, it, it's fascinating, you know, at the different levels that we have a population, you know, we have immigrant families, we have people that don't use English as their first language. There's all sorts of challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And so anything we can open the conversation that we can help. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've helped children of clients. I have a little fake check and I say, here's how you write a check. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, it's interesting that you bring that up, Barbara, and my husband has given me permission to share these stories. They're in uh, my book, Breaking Money Silent, so you're, they're not going to be surprised by them. Uh, but one of the things that happened when we first got together, he didn't grow up with a lot of financial literacy, and I grew up with a fair amount, was I taught him how to write a check and how to do taxes. Very oh romantic, God. right? Super romantic, but really necessary. So my point in sharing that is whether it is your romantic partner, whether it is somebody at the bank, whether it's just a girlfriend or someone you know, you know, if you break money silence and say, hey, I don't know how to do this, what you're going to find out is a lot of other people don't know how to do it or they're very happy to share with you and mentor you in that area. And I think that's the harm of money silence. When we don't talk about it, we think everybody else has got it figured out. And when we do talk about it, we realize, oh, wait a second, I know parts of this and that, and you know parts of this and that, and together we can learn more and get a little bit stronger. And we'll be stronger and smarter for having had the conversation. Absolutely. And when you think about some other statistics that say that working age women aren't as confident as working age men in their feelings of preparing for retirement or dealing with money. And you wonder why is that? Is it because as women, those my age and older, obviously, were probably that discussion was squelched. And so when I look at still the working age, I'm thinking now let's get those younger people up here. They, I am hoping they're becoming more confident. And if they're not, they need to be speaking to their friends and to their professionals and their advisors or perhaps their parents. But one of the things that I find women make their first mistake, and that is in the lack of negotiation when they have their first job. Excuse the interruption. 
I know you're listening to High Towers Keeping the Well and Wealthy podcast. But if you have questions related to these or other wellness and financial issues, please reach out to your advisor or go to hightoweradvisors.com to find a financial advisor near you. Now, back to Barbara. Absolutely. I think that's a, a big piece that I spend a lot of time working with women of all ages around. One thing I just want to say to get back to the first comment is I do think that women tend to report that they're not confident or say that they don't know something a little bit easier than men do. So the results uh. may be skewed a bit and that on average, men tend to be overconfident because they've been socialized to be overconfident. Women tend to be the first one to be like, oh, I'm a mess. I don't know what I'm doing. So I, I think we need to no, factor that's that good. in. We no, need to that's great. Good, good back, feedback. Yeah. And the other thing when it comes to negotiation, actually, I just got back from Florida. I was speaking at a women's conference and I was teaching a negotiation seminar, which is so much fun to teach. Um, and one of the stories I told was about my niece. As I was flying down to this particular presentation, my niece at the same time, who's in her early 30s, is negotiating a new job with a law firm in a big city. <laughs> so oh, I had a connecting exciting. flight. Yeah, it was. So in the beginning, uh, I talked to her and she's like, here's what I negotiated here. Here's what I'm looking at. What do you think? I need to have a conversation at 11. I go, I'm going to be on a flight, but think about these things. And we talked about how to think about negotiating, not just the money, but also the benefits, any, you know, a big package like executive coaching or additional tuition reimbursement, a variety of things. I jumped on my flight. I got into the connector and right before I boarded, she said, I just had the conversation. I said all those things and, and they're going to get back to me. And by the time I actually landed in Florida for my presentation, she had landed the job with a nice <sighs> package. So oh, that, congratulations to her. Yeah, and thank I had everybody you for supporting her. Yeah, I had everybody clap for her. But I think with negotiation, we have to be careful. One of the things I don't want to reinforce is the message that women aren't good at negotiation. Mm. I know that's out there. I know I do negotiation workshops and I do coaching. But I think what we need to keep in mind is that women, if you look historically, haven't had as much practice as men. And so part of what we're doing is we're catching up because we're relatively new to the workforce. If you look at, you know, we're the first generation that work full time in the, the workforce and then looking at what are our automatic thoughts? What are our mindset around negotiation? And then how do we really become strategic and walk into that negotiation room, break money silence, ask for what we're worth and also have to face, you know, unconscious gender bias. So that it's, it's asking a lot, mm, it but is what asking I noticed, yeah. But what I noticed at this conference, Barbara, which was so exciting is most of those women in the room were like my niece's age. So thirties to forties, I didn't feel very young, but thirties to forties and they were talking about money and they were yes. supporting each other and they were negotiating. So it really gave me some hope for the future around women confidence and negotiation. Well, and I have a daughter in her thirties and she's very open about talking to her other friends about now, how much are you making at this particular company? Now she's I in know. private equity, but they're very open about sharing this so that they can help each other. And I said, boy, the women really talk like this. She goes, not just the women, mom, I'm calling my guy friends. I'm finding <laughs> out. She goes, cause this, you know, I don't want to be any different or looked at differently. Right. So it is a conversation they're having more than we ever did. Oh, more I can't even imagine did. showing up to my first job in the big eighties and oh, no. asking someone what they made, but I am so thrilled that we're having salary transparency and that everybody's participating because that's the solution to, to talking more about money is it's not one gender versus the other. It's having everybody become more comfortable with these conversations. And what I find is when people do start the conversation, they find out that, oh, wait a second. So first of all, this is helpful. It's interesting. And it's not that scary. And it's a muscle you build up over time that breaking money silence gets easier and easier as time goes by. And some of us find it fun. Yes, I, having I do conversations. too. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, Barbara. I don't well, know if we're in the uh, minority, but I, I'm glad that we do. Oh, I'm enjoying it. But you mentioned about confidence. So I want to talk about how to build financial confidence. So whether we're talking about children with a lower financial literacy rate, or as an adult, how do we build our own financial confidence so that we can have these conver conversations? That's a great question. When I think about financial confidence, I think about a couple of different components. 
I think about the fact that there are financial skills you need to know, that there's financial knowledge you need to know. And when we think about skills and knowledge, we think financial literacy. So that's the nuts and bolts of finance, learning okay. basic money skills, how to save money, how to spend money, how to invest money, how to gift money or kind of at the core. Uh, and on top of that, I would layer one other element given who I am and what I believe is going to make a difference in people's financial confidence. And that's being able to really understand your money personality. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's referred to as your money mindset, understanding how you are and your psychology around money, which is unique to every person as an overlay on top of the skills and the knowledge. So it's skills, knowledge, and insight into your relationship with money ultimately leads to leads. I'm going to say that again. Okay. Just Here pause. we go. <laughs> so the three components are skills, knowledge, and insight into your relationship with money. And those three together add up to be confidence around finance. And so if you're going to build your confidence over time, no, you can pick and choose which area you're going to work on when you don't need to do it all at once, but those are the three places you should focus. And I tell people, start where you're interested. Don't start where you should start with what interests you and ask an advisor, ask a friend, take an online course. I mean, there's a lot of different resources out there to start building that confidence. Absolutely. Good. Well, I have one more area I'd like to dig into a little bit, and that is we do still see a gap between men and women as they approach retirement. And when I look at all the reasons, obviously some women have changed their mm, thoughts about whether or not they're going to stay home with their children or not. But those that stay home obviously have a work history gap. Many people now are taking some time off or they're being stressed out caring for older adults, mm -hmm. whether it's their parents or perhaps a sibling that's disabled. So women still seem to be the primary caregivers. That hasn't changed dramatically yet. At least I haven't seen it change. And that provides that sense of insecurity sometimes to women because they don't have that longer work history. And sometimes they've got a bow out and then come back in. Have you worked with women that have had that experience? Oh, I think a lot of women, Barbara, have had that experience. And, and I think what it speaks to isn't that there's anything wrong with women caregiving or choosing to, to make these decisions in terms of what's going to bring the most quality of life for them and their individual desires. I think what's wrong is systematically we penalize women for caregiving the, you know, for kids and elderly parents. So my sense is there needs to be some systematic shifts in how workplaces are looking at women who take time off or men. I know the younger generation, some of the men are certainly taking time as well. Yes. Uh, and so I do think there's that systematic it's issue. Changing. I, I think the other piece that's more the individual piece is it would be really great for anybody who's listening out here. Um, to this podcast that has a younger person in their life, uh, and we're focusing on females here, to introduce them to a financial advisor. Their financial advisor is a great place to start. Because if someone learns the importance of saving for retirement early, and then evaluating these decisions, not only in terms of how this is going to be for my life, but how is this going to be for my finances, I think people can make more informed choices and figure out how to fully fund their retirements. So I think it's a, it's a combination of the system and then us all working together to mentor the next generation um, to really start saving as soon as possible for that last phase of life. No, that's terrific. And we've talked about when we address money with our children as early as possible, as often as possible. And I want to talk about the parents or grandparents. When mm -hmm. is a good time to start bringing the next generation in and having that conversation about their transfer of wealth, what their plans are, what their values, their perceptions of what they want done with their money. When's a good time for that? I would say that, you know, that's a tricky question because it really varies person to person. Mm -hmm. But I would say that as you are thinking about putting together a financial plan, if you're thinking about your values, that it's it, that is the time to start to think about what is next. And not to say that 
you can't live your values now, but part of passing on wealth is passing on your family values. It's raising kids, or in my case, it would be influencing nieces and nephews to be able to be financially literate. So I wouldn't wait till you're like right at retirement thinking about, you know, moving on to this next phase of your life. I would really encourage people to do it as soon as they start financially planning in small ways. But, you know, I don't know when you typically do it with your clients, Barbara. Well, whenever we're talking about estate planning and we're trying mm -hmm. to understand what they want to do for their community, their family, their values. And I think that's why I find talking about money fun, because it's not just about the dollar. It's about what the dollar can do, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, what do we want to do for our children? And we know how important it is to plan for education. We might be talking about a child's upcoming or a grandchild's upcoming wedding. They want to do something special for them or having that desire to say, I want to donate for, to a particular charitable cause, or I want to make a change in my community. I want to make a difference. We have a, a line that we use, and it, it's pretty simple. It's make a plan, make an investment, make a difference. That doesn't necessarily mean money. Mm -hmm. It opens up that conversation for money, but we can all make differences in our communities and our families and ourselves. But having that conversation can be fun when you're talking about the financial part, along with the values and the dreams part. Well, isn't that the essence of financial well-being? I mean, if you think about it financial well-being, it's the emotional component and there's also the financial component, but part of the emotional component is identifying what's important to you and making sure that you are spending, gifting, saving, investing money or passing on uh, wealth in a way that aligns with your values. And when we think about it in those terms, it becomes uh, full of possibilities and can be more fun than if we think of it in the traditional terms of, oh, you're going to die and you're going to have to tell people where your money's going. That just isn't, <laughs> isn't as much fun, but that's how it used to be presented. It used to be, but making it a living legacy right. is and, more fun. And doing it as early and often in terms of your own relationship with money, really focusing on that financial well-being means that by the time you get to estate planning and having these conversations with the next generation, you already know how to do that and what's important to you. So then it becomes, how do you work with an advisor or a consultant or coach to be able to uh, engage in those conversations? So, um, you know, I think the whole field is shifting to more of the human side of finance and the financial well-being. And I, I think that's just good for everyone across generations. So Kathleen, this has been such a pleasure and we appreciate your mission to break the money silence. So if I just think about a few ideas that you've shared one, we can change our relationship with money, but it's helpful to understand our own personal scripts. And we must start generational money conversations earlier and often, and also for the conversation of a transfer of wealth. And, you know, we should all be working with each other to increase financial literacy. And I'm still going to throw in here learning to negotiate or at least <laughs> ask, right? You never know till you ask, Barbara. That's exactly <laughs> right. So Kathleen, can I ask people to be able to contact you at your email? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So uh, kbk at breakingmoneysilence.com. Yes, any, any questions, comments, anything you want to know, I, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to chat with you. Well, thank you. And you have a website breakingmoneysilence.com, where I would encourage people to go visit because I have, and it's a terrific site. Thank you. Thank you. There's some free money talk tips people can sign up for too. So that might be a nice piece that they could do at no cost to keep the conversation alive. Lovely. And before we invite Eric in to join us, I have one more question for you. Yes. How do you keep your well and wealthy? I am so good at keeping my well and wealthy, <laughs> Barbara. In the winter, and it is snowing as we're recording this today, I ski, alpine ski and backcountry ski. And in the summer, I mountain bike and kayak and just get in touch with nature and laugh with my friends. So I work very hard to practice what I preach. And I'm happy to report it's very satisfying. And I encourage people to really focus on whatever their well and wealthy is as well. Oh, thank you. Well, Eric, will you join us again, please? Absolutely. This has been fantastic.
Well, hearing Kathleen's advice on breaking that money taboo talk, how do you think you can help spread the word? Well, I, I really like the focus on young women uh, when it comes to expanding their horizons. Barbara, you and I have spoken on air and off air before as a father of a daughter and a grandfather of a granddaughter or two granddaughters now. I don't want them to feel either ashamed or bashful or meek when it comes to money. I want them to be bold. I want them to be, you know, know their value, know their worth. And I think even through this conversation, I'm hearing that it is shifting in that direction, which I think is fabulous. Uh, I just want to make sure it continues so that they don't get the short end of the stick, right? Whatever their focus is, whether they want to have kids or not have kids, they should be able to earn a fair wage for what they do and, and be proud of it. And so I'm excited to hear the work that you guys are doing. Well, thank you. Well, Kathleen, Many, many thanks for opening up this conversation. I look forward to having a conversation with you again about this because obviously it's fun for us and we want to make sure we can encourage others to have this conversation, break that silence about money. And is there anything else you'd like to share with us? I just want to thank you and Eric for bringing my work um, to light. And also thank you for uh, breaking money silence with me. It's always fun to chat about these topics and I'm inspired by each and every conversation. Thank you. Kathleen, thank you so much. Barbara, of course, thank you for facilitating this. And of course, our last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Keeping the Well and Wealthy with Barbara Archer. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way when Barbara comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it and leave a review, as this actually does help others find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Hightower, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to go out in the world and make a difference. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Keeping the Well in Wealthy with Barbara Archer, sponsored by Hightower. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Hightower Wealth Advisors. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Hightower Wealth Advisors is a group comprised of investment professionals registered with Hightower Advisors LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Some investment professionals may also be registered with Hightower Securities LLC, member FINRA and SIPC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors LLC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities LLC. This is not an offer to buy or sell securities. No investment process is free of risk and there is no guarantee that the investment process or the investment opportunities referenced herein will be profitable. Past performance is neither indicative nor a guarantee of future results. The investment opportunities referenced herein may not be suitable for all investors. All data or other information referenced herein is from sources believed to be reliable. Any opinions, news, research, analysis, prices, or other data or information contained in this presentation is provided as general market commentary and does not constitute investment advice. Hightower Wealth Advisors and Hightower Advisors LLC or any of its affiliates make no representations or warranties expressed or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the information or for statements or errors or omissions or results obtained from the use of this information. Hightower Wealth Advisors and Hightower Advisors LLC assume no liability for any action made or taken in reliance on or relating in any way to this information. The information is provided as of the date referenced in the document. Such data and other information are subject to change without notice. This document was created for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed herein are solely those of the authors and do not represent those of Hightower Advisors LLC or any of its affiliates. Hightower Advisors LLC or any of its affiliates do not provide tax or legal advice. This material is not intended or written to provide and should not be relied upon or used as a substitute for tax or legal advice. Information contained herein does not consider an individual's or entity's specific circumstances or applicable governing law, which may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and be subject to change. Clients are urged to consult their tax or legal advisor for related questions.